Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to continue in our study with fighting the good fight. Um, we do have some prayer requests tonight. Uh, Sister Annie Watkins was in the hospital earlier with um, some heart issues, and I believe she had a stent put in. Um, and Joanne Lawyer uh, needs prayer. She has been diagnosed with cancer, so we need to pray for Joanne. Brother Steve Pollard needs uh, physical strength. He really needs, still needs prayer. I understand that he's got some uh, physical therapist uh, coming and helping him, and so we need to remember him in prayer. I understand that Chad Hustetler was taken to the um, emergency room or hospital somewhere, uh, but he had some issues with uh, an allergic reaction to some medicine, and the daughter, Isabel, is uh, very sick as well. And then my brother-in-law, uh, Robert Venable, is in the hospital tonight, uh, recovering from a heart ablation earlier today. Are there any others that are urgent needs that we need to pray about tonight? Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We have a lot that are sick in our church. We've had a lot of flu and uh, bronchitis and pneumonia and all kinds of stuff. So let's remember our church family tonight as we go to prayer. Brother Eric, would you lead us to the Lord? Lord, I thank you for this uh, chance to come here and fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ and be fed by your word. And Lord, we've got a lot of needs in our midst, uh, many spoken, many not spoken. You know what they are. And we're laying all those uh, needs and concerns and cares at the foot of the cross, knowing that nothing's too hard for you. Help us to have faith and forgive us, Lord, when we lack faith. And help us tonight to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. I ask you would anoint your servant and help her to speak the words you'd have us to hear. And, you know, let all this uh, bear fruit in our lives and that we can reflect you in everything we do and everything we say. Uh, just... Lord, just uh, keep a hedge of protection around all our people as we go back home. And, you know, just uh, help us be good disciples in every way. These things ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to do just a real quick update since uh, someone might have missed last Wednesday night. We talked about the equipment that we would wear. So the first thing we talked about was the belt of what? Truth. And then we talked about the breastplate of righteousness and the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet and the sword. Okay, if we take and look at just the blue underline that I just did, sometimes we get so caught up with the piece of equipment and where it's located but think about this. When we talk about the armor of God, we're talking about the truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the Spirit. How critical this equipment is for us to be carrying into our journey. Because if we're truly going to be successful in the fight, we need this operating in our lives. Amen. So tonight we're going to continue on and we're going to take the offensive in chapter 4. A lot of times we think about offense, defense, you know, on ball teams and um, we get really caught up in, you know, well, he didn't protect him and he didn't do this or that or he just stood idly by. Uh, but when we look at what we're really uh, thinking about spiritually, we want to take the offensive. And so we go into chapter 4 and if you bought the book, that's on page 61. If you need an outline, raise your hand and we will get one to you uh, because it's typed out directly from the book. So uh, tonight in our introduction, they use the word panoplia as the whole armor. So here on earth, there's a continuous spiritual battle and it goes on ceaselessly. It never ends. It's continuous. The rebellious kingdom of this world is on the defensive because the kingdom of God with Jesus Christ as head has invaded it. So the church, which is part of the kingdom of God, is engaged in an offensive war that will ultimately lead to complete and unquestioned victory. Amen? 
In claiming the fullness of the victory Christ secured at Calvary, believers must continue to press on and press on until all the forces of the enemy have been made to put down their weapons. The struggle is violent and dangerous. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 and 11 to put on the whole armor of God. So that's why if I were to call you up here and I were to ask you to pick the one you want to leave off, you would be leaving yourself unprotected. We need every piece of this equipment. So that's why we are studying this series. That's why we're taking a look at it. Because the term whole armor or panoplia means full armor coming from the word pas, meaning all, any, every, thoroughly, whatsoever, whole with the word hoplon. Panoplia has to do with the entire array of weaponry of a soldier. It was his complete arsenal for war. So this is our arsenal. It's a word hoplon that Paul uses in Romans 13 and 12. Let us put on the armor of light, carrying the meaning of an implement or utensil or tool, especially of an offensive nature, armor, instrument, or weapon. So the practical application then of the whole armor of a spiritual warrior is first, that our armaments be complete. And secondly, these armaments have an offensive quality to them as opposed to a defensive quality. So as Christian soldiers, we are part of an invasionary territory taking army that will stop at nothing short of total conquest. This warfare requires of Christians that we be combat ready. And so we know that we studied Sunday that uh, in Jericho when they were going around the walls and each day they went around once and they weren't talking or anything Nothing was being said. It was total silence. And then on the seventh day at the blow of the trumpet, they shouted. And you can imagine what an uproar that was. But think about it if you were inside of the city gates, if you were inside of that wall and you were peeping out, how confused you would be. What's going on? What are they doing? And so when we are connected with the fruit of the Spirit and then we put on this armament, we have an arsenal And so we've studied the fruit, now we're looking at the arsenal. We need that because as we are going and the Lord directed them and they didn't have to uh, do a battle plan or anything because God won the war. And so he's the one that brought the walls down. You cannot win this war on your own smarts on your own wisdom, on your own war planning. The only way we can win is if we are combat ready through using the full armor of God. Amen. So the first part of the lesson talks about the profile of a combat ready soldier. The first thing that they say is you must be tough. So in 2 Timothy 2 and 3, Paul writes, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So it's clear to Paul that the ability to endure hardness equates to being a good soldier. Endure hardness, or cacopathia, essentially means to undergo hardship, be afflicted, endure afflictions, hardness, or suffer trouble. Now, who in the world wants to sign up for that? You know, uh, we look at it and it's telling us we're going to have to endure hardship. But then he, the same writer, I believe, says that I can and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we know that if we follow directions, if we do what he tells us to do, we're going to be successful. We'll win. And so we might go through the valley for a short period of time when we really think about it. But the big picture is we're the winners. We look in the back of the book and we know we win. The life of a soldier by its very nature is subject to hard and painful living conditions that necessitate an ability to be tough and endure. We've seen our soldiers go through awful things. When they come back, they tell us of of terrible things that they had to endure and go through. Roman soldiers had a hard life with food that was often scarce. They had to make do while carrying heavy loads of supplies and weapons. 
So Peter alludes to this characteristic of a good soldier of Christ when he writes in 1 Peter 4 and 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. So a good soldier expects to face some hardships and is thus not caught off guard. And so the second characteristic, he must be brave. Must be tough, but he must be brave. A combat-ready soldier must be brave. His fear is to have no place in the heart and life of a believer. Over and over again, the Lord tells us in the word, fear not. Luke 12 and 32, fear not, little flock. 1 John 4, 18, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. The spirit of fear cannot rule along with the spirit of bravery or faith at the same time. And I liked that play on the words there because when we think about bravery, we think about we can be brave when we have faith. We know that there are times when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we literally feel like we could, you know, hang from the chandeliers. We could, you know, run, uh, leap tall buildings and run on the back of the chairs and never miss a beat. We feel almost supernatural. I know that when uh, my sickness came along, I almost felt like that, you know, I was outside of myself looking on at what was going on. And so we can be strong in faith and that faith will generate the bravery that we need to face the situation as it comes to us. How in the world could Stephen stand there and take the stone and, and, and pray for his enemies? How do we face life? How do we face those things that come against us as a Christian warrior? He must, a soldier must know that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but rather the spirit of fear has been aimed as a weapon by the enemy to hinder the believer. So the Old Testament, if a man was fearful or faint-hearted, they sent him away from the army. They run him back home because they did not want his fear to spread to the other troops preparing for battle in Deuteronomy 20 and 8. And that's why we as Christians must be strong in the faith because we need to be bringing others up to our level, not coming down to their level. And so it, when we see here that they didn't allow the faint-hearted or the feel for to hang around, they wanted strong, tough, and brave warriors. Uh, in 20 and 14, uh, or 20 verses 1 through 4, in laying out a plan for waging war, it puts great emphasis on being brave in the knowledge that God will fight for his people and that fear has no ranks of the army of the Lord. When I look at that, it's we can be brave if we're in the knowledge of God. In other words, we understand and realize this is not my battle, but whose? It's the Lord's battle. And so we can make it, we can do it because we know that fear has no place when God is looking out for us. I like this little uh, box at the bottom. You may not be able to see it, but it says, I am loved because I am chosen by Jesus. I am known because I am named by Jesus. I am fearless because I am safe in Jesus. And I am brave because I am always with Jesus. And I'll tell you that if we are always with Jesus, we'll be brave. We'll be able to stand up and hold the standard of holiness and hold up our faith. And we're able to stand the fiery darts of the enemy because we have put our faith not in our own capabilities and our own capacities and our own wisdom, but we've put it in our almighty God. We know that he saved us. He sanctified us. He filled us with his Holy Spirit and we are brave. We can stand in faith because of him because of him. Deuteronomy 20 says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be when you are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let 
not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Amen. Amen. So we don't have to fear because they outnumber us. We don't have to fear because it doesn't look good to us. We don't have to fear because we don't see the solution to the problem. All we need to do is to remember whose battle it is and what he's doing for us. So let's put away the trembling. Let's put away being terrified. But as soon as that comes upon us, and it will, we speak to it and put it right back in its place and say, I know who I serve and he is in control. The combat soldier of Christ knows that our general has never been defeated and that he never shall be defeated. You see, when we looked back on the, the slide before, he talked about uh, when they go out, said he told him, he said, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. In other words, he says to us, don't stand there and get up tight all in your own self, but look back at what I've already done for you. Look back at the victories that I have already given my people. And I know each one of you have got a testimony, and I know some of your testimonies, and there have been times when your testimonies have ministered to me and blessed me. And that's why we are together as a church, so that we can help each other. Amen? And so we reach back, and we look to those things past, and we understand that he brought us through the fire and he'll do it again. Amen. The combat ready soldier of Christ knows our general has never been defeated and never shall be. Our general knows the enemy we face and he knows the terrain upon which we will fight him. We have a commander in chief who never orders us to go any place that he's not already been himself. To be prepared, or the third part is he must be disciplined. We must be disciplined. To be prepared for warfare as part of a larger army, an individual is not truly fit to be called a soldier unless they are first a disciplined individual. As can be inferred from the term disciple, to follow Christ is to live out a life dedicated to him and under the self-imposed disciplines of prayer and Bible study. The disciple of Christ is one who willingly denies himself and takes up his own cross and follows Jesus. I think we all know the definition and honestly we have to just keep applying it over and over and over to ourselves. The true disciple loves Jesus more than anyone or anything else in existence. His greatest desire is to both love and serve his master. In Roman times, the soldier kept one principle foremost in his mind, that of giving service to his commanding officer. He was not even free to be a part of any sort of trade or business apart from his obligations. We remember the story where um, in the Bible where they were required to do certain things and when the soldiers were were called upon, uh, they didn't stand there and figure out, well, I know a better way. Let's do it this way. They didn't stand there and discuss it or argue or anything else. When they were given an order, what did they do? They stood to attention, saluted, and they did it. And so a lot of times when we think about disciplining ourselves, there's a lot of times that we try to negotiate what the Lord is really leading us to in our lives, what he is impressing on us in our lives. And so if we learn to just go ahead and give in to the Lord right away, it would save us a whole lot of heartache sometime because sometimes we think we've got a better way. But the Word tells us the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And so he wasn't able to go out as a soldier and do any other business. He re was required to take care of his commanding officer. 
Um, in ancient Hebrew times, men who had other major competing life interests were excluded from service. Um, and maybe that's what Paul meant in 2 Timothy 2 and 4. He instructs Timothy, No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So let us not forget who we are pleasing. It is not, you know, anybody else. It's the Father. We are to please Him and bring Him glory and honor. And to do that, we must be an instrument or a vessel that can be used for His glory. And we can't be used for His glory if we leave ourselves open to the attacks of the enemy. We've got to be prepared and fully ready and on duty at all times. The affairs of the life refer to those things that compete with Jesus in our lives. As soldiers of the cross, we can only hope to please Him who chose us if we are also willing to discipline ourselves. I read one of our sisters posted uh, recently on Facebook, uh, and she gave a testimony of how she you know, met with the, the ball team, and she told them, uh, my child will not participate on Wednesday nights and Sundays. Um, that's church. And they will not participate. And she went on to say that there were times that they scheduled it, uh, a couple of times that they scheduled it. Um, and it was pretty big games, and she was an important key player on the team. And and she said, I told them, you know, she can't make it. And, and they just carried on the game anyway. And it was, uh, it was supposed to be done, I think, on a Sunday afternoon. And it was a critical, critical game. It was going to mean whether they were going to win the season or not. And as I said, she was one of their key players. And so what happened that afternoon? Of course, the child was disappointed. They weren't going to get to play in the game because it was on Sunday. And what happened that afternoon? But it poured a flood and they couldn't have the game and it was delayed and not only did she get to play the game she was voted the MVP the most valuable player in the game I'm telling you when we put him first when he put, we put him first he blesses us he takes care of us but when we don't then we leave ourselves open for the attacks um, must be evangelistic um, and I, I kind of get tickled every time that word because uh, we had a friend one time that would get uh, what I called evangelistic with his little um, stories. And so uh, we would always, that word evangelistic between Larry and I always meant a certain thing. Uh, but being evangelistic may not sound as if it would be a requirement to be a combat ready soldier. But in truth it goes to the very core of why we are fighting in this conflict in the first place. The very purpose Christ came to earth was to seek and save those who are lost. And our master's mission is, by extension, our mission. His mission, our mission. As citizen soldiers of the kingdom of God, we serve not only to destroy the works of the devil, but to expand the kingdom of righteousness, truth, love, and deliverance to a sin-sick world. So, as ministers of reconciliation, that's what it's called, 2 Corinthians 5 and 18, we serve also as ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5 and 20, to a lost, alienated world. So you are an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can positively uh, affect someone and reflect the light of Christ, or not so positively. And so our job is the Great Commission. We are called to make disciples of all nations. And I was talking the other day to someone and I said I'm part of that keeping ministry I'm not so good at the front end where we go out and you know we pass out tracks and we, we greet people at the door and um, some of y'all have such a gift of hospitality and they come in that door and you really make them feel good and I don't know how you do it That I, I, don't, I don't know how you do it 
uh, but you do it and you do a great job of it uh, and I'm not so good at that but uh, if you'll get them in here and let me get to know them then I, I'm on the other team the other team is we don't want them to go out that door you know we want to keep them and so I, I always in myself called that a keeping ministry um, where we don't want to lose not one single one and if we do it should grieve our hearts it should hurt us um, because we love them and they're part of the family and and I can't help if they're going to another family God I still cry I still grieve I still sorrowful because they left because every single one of us are unique beings and when God put us together he bonded us and binded us and he caused us to work together in unity of spirit for him and so when one leaves that particular personality or whatever it was that giftedness just walked out our door so we don't want to lose a single one is that selfish no no okay thank you Roman armies didn't just conquer nations and peoples, they actually Romanized them. Uh, they made them uh, uh, of the people and the places that they overcame. So if they moved in, they became part of the culture. They sort of took over the country. The culture of Rome then began to take hold and civilize the native people. The very ones who once fought Rome essentially became Romans themselves. Though not all the conquered peoples became Romanized, many did and were later proud to be considered Roman. But take a step back and think about what I just said. They became Romans. Those who once fought against Rome and warred against Rome all of a sudden they were Rome they were part of the Romans their culture, their beliefs everything that, Romans, that Rome stood for, they stood for they gave up their identity and they became Romans and if we're not careful, we can rub shoulders with the elbow and elbows with the world so often and so much that if we don't keep our armor on, we're going to become like the world. We are not going to be our Christian selves shining a strong light, of a beacon of light, but we're going to all of a sudden begin to think and smell and talk and touch and act like a Roman act like the culture that we're around and I'll tell you this is a warning to us it's a warning because we cannot be an aggressive soldier an evangelistic soldier a bold soldier a tough soldier without our equipment because we won't succeed and we will become part of the culture that we are surrounded by and I say we stay Christian we stay holy. We stay righteous. And the only way we can do it successfully is to keep our armor on. That just was a warning to me as I studied this lesson. It's really a fearful thing when you can no longer decipher the church from the world. It's a fearful thing. Ephesians 2.19 Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. As the army of God we must realize that Satan is the real enemy. It's not people. He works through people but it's not them. It's Satan. The people of our world are all potential citizens of God's kingdom. And we're to spread the news the good news of Jesus Christ. The Great Commission is our prime order, but as we go, we must be ready to make spiritual war in the way that Christ has taught us. And then there's a little outline in your book, Spiritual Warfare and Our Offensive Armor. Uh, and it talks about the Church of Jesus Christ is an army of invasion 
in attacking the strongholds of the enemy and setting the captives free. Um, and that is located in your book. I copied and pasted it on the outline. The soldier of the Lord must be tough, brave, disciplined, dis disciplined, and evangelistic. And we see the word and we see our prayers and our offensive armor, the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the agreement of believers, uh, fasting unto the Lord and praise unto the Lord. That is what we're going to cover in in this chapter 4. And the assurance to us is at the very bottom, the gates of hell shall not prevail. And I think as a, as a soldier, a warrior, we need to constantly remind ourselves we're on the winning team. We're on the winning side. We're not going down, we're going up. We're going up in victory. And then the next part of the lesson, uh, B, the two access weapons of our warfare. Of all the spiritual armaments available to the believer engaged in spiritual warfare, whether they are defensive armor or offensive weaponry, two pieces of spiritual warfare are necessary in order to be able to successfully use all the other weapons. These two provide access to the other armaments of our arsenal. So God wants his people to be both adequately protected he is a buckler to all them that trust in him, 2 Samuel 22 and 31, and thoroughly trained to attack. He teacheth my hands to war, 2, Timothy, or 2 Samuel 22 and 35. Through the word of God and prayer, we are able to receive orders and request reinforcements when needed. So he doesn't leave us alone. We can, through uh, the Word of God and through praying, we can call out to the Father. It says uh, in Second Samuel, God is my strength and power, and He maketh my way perfect. And so, first, the two access, the Word of God, that is a weapon. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, has value as a defensive weapon. We saw how Jesus used it, uh, used the Word of God, it is written, to dissolve every attack of Satan in the wilderness temptation. So the Word of God is a powerful weapon for the believer who wishes to take the offensive in spiritual war. If a Christian truly desires to refute error and destroy the lying accusations of the devil, he must know the Word. And that's what you're doing. You're studying the Word. You're trying to prepare yourself because we understand that we are in a continual warfare. And then the next part, it must be heard. The Word of God must be heard. Scripture must first be heard in order to access the faith that it provides. Romans 10, 17 tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we know we must read the Word and hear the Word. And it must be meditated upon. Having heard the Word, the believer must meditate on it. To meditate carries the idea of a cow ruminating its cud. The cow is slowly digesting what it has already ingested. That's my husband in the mornings when he gets through with his devotion. He will chew that cud for a little while and it's not long because he'll come and find me and he'll begin to tell me something that he got out of his devotion that morning. So I know it's coming. I'm going to get me a nugget for the day. It just might not be at the same time every day, but he'll start to meditate on it and that word begins to speak to him and to give him strength and insight for maybe something that we as a family are going through or whatever. When we meditate upon the word, we are literally digesting it into our spirit. The righteous man of Psalm 1 is blessed in part because it says, in his law doth he meditate day and night. So the word is so critical to us. It must be acted upon. Hearing and meditating the, on the Word must be followed up by doing the Word. The truths we learn and the principles we are taught must be acted out on every day, carried out in our everyday life. The Word of God gives the believer access to the orders that come from our Commander-in-Chief. Not acting upon what we learn in the Word is obey, disobeying orders. James 1.22, But be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceive your own selves. So we don't want to be guilty of being disobedient to the voice of the Father. Amen. 
And then uh, the second access weapon is prayer. As the Word of God gives us access to faith, hope, wisdom, and so much more. So prayer gives us access to the throne of God and thereby to His mercy, forgiveness, provision, protection, and guidance. The value of prayer as a spiritual weapon of access is apparent. And just look at the things that we listed there that we have access to. Mercy, forgiveness, provision, protection, guidance. These are things that we can go to our Father and ask for. When I was going home with Janet or Sylvia after church on Sundays, um, if it was my turn to go to their house, I would go to my dad and I'd say, can I go home? Whatever your mother says is okay with me. Well, I'd go to mama and mama would say, yeah. I'd run back to daddy. Because mama would just say, yeah, you can go. But I'd go back to daddy and I'd say, daddy, mama said I can go to Sylvia's today. He said, well, he, now y'all going to laugh at this. But he'd say, here's a quarter and here's one for her too. When I laugh, but we could go to the store and buy some Pepsi Cola, a honey bun, and a bag of tater chips, all for that 25 cents. So I made sure I rounded the bases and went back to Daddy, and I got that 25 cents so that I could get me something. Well, this is what I'm talking about here. The same principle is that we have access to our Heavenly Father. And just because you can't look in His eyes and ask Him for that 25 cents, if you need that 25 cents, we can talk to Him and we can ask Him. He gives us access to the throne room of God. And it's through the blood of Jesus Christ that we can go to Him and ask Him for whatsoever we need. So prayer is such a valuable spiritual weapon. It is the central activity of warfare. Prayer is unquestionably critical and can justifiably be called the delivery system that delivers powerful blows against Satan's strongholds of bondage and despair. Precisely because our warfare is spiritual in nature, prayer becomes the basic weapon and the central activity of the child of God. I believe Pastor was telling us Sunday, pray without ceasing. And so this gets into our spirit. And as we're going about our task and doing things, how many times do we talk to the Father? And not only it's not only just to ask for things, but it's to send forth praises during the day. Because let me tell you something, without uh, praising Him and worshiping Him, and what would our lives be? And without Him giving even the breath that we have, we would not be able to. But what value, what, uh, can you just imagine living without the Lord? Can you just think back without His input and His influence in us? It, it's, it's just not even possible to think about. Um, it holds the other pieces of the armor together, it being prayer. All of the armor pieces listed in Ephesians 6 are important, but without the armor of prayer, none of them will adhere to the soul of a Christian warrior. Prayer is the essential implement of spiritual warfare that sustains and protects all other armor. Indeed, the first words of Ephesians 6, 18, after listing the armor pieces of the believer, are praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And so he lists all of these things, and then he says right after that, right after listing all of these, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So it's an aggressive action. A believer can pray prayers of confession, worship, petition, intercessory prayers, but regardless of the kind of prayer, we must remember that it is active and not passive. It's an aggressive action. It takes the initiative away from Satan and places it back into the strategy of the Lord's army. And that's where it belongs. We must use prayer to challenge the power of hell and bring about the kingdom of God. Jesus told us to pray after this manner. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6 and 10. And when I think about that, I think about um, a friend of mine because we're talking about being aggressive. And we're talking about using prayer um, as a challenge. 
um, to the enemy. And so one time she had uh, a couple of uh, real good blessings on Sunday night and then she'd have some major uh, thing that blew up in her home on Monday. And she said, as she came over one day and knocked on my door and I went, she come running in my house and went running right and fell right across my bed. And she was just boohooing. And uh, she, she just cried her heart out. And she said, I tell you, I'm at the point I don't even want the Lord to bless me anymore. Because uh, I'll get a blessing on Sunday night and then Monday, everything comes against me. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself now, I, first off, I was, I was a kid. I was young, very, very young. And I thought, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Um, and it came to me so clearly that without that blessing on Sunday night, how in the world would you be able to face Monday morning? Amen. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I talked to her after kind of got calmed down a little bit. I was able to talk to her and, and share with her um, this, this feeling that I had about it. Because if we're not careful, we think about how hard that last fight was. We think about how hard that last battle was for us. Think about the last time you really went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy and he was coming up against your family or your health or whatever it, the situation was. And just think about how helpless you felt and then all of a sudden you began to remember whose you were. You rem remembered who you are in Christ Jesus. And you began to say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And you began to connect to the source of the power in your life. And you began to be able to fight the fight that was there before you. And so sometimes when we're over here and we're resting in between this battle and we're not really having to fight all that hard, we're just kind of bobbing along day after day and things are going pretty good and nothing really has fallen into your lap. And all of a sudden... You begin to see the fight starting to head your way. Little signs, little things are creeping up. And you begin to say to yourself, oh no, I really don't want to have to go there. I don't want to have to do that. You know? But at the same time, we remind ourselves whose we are. And we say, okay, Lord, you got me through that one. And so we reach in the past and we drag it back up to us. Because each and every one of you, as I've said before, have got lines in the sand. Where you can take somebody back to that place and say, but God. I know what he did for me. You can't take it from me. You can't make me doubt it. I know. So when we see the battle coming, we begin to pray and intercede on behalf of ourselves and the situation so that we're strong in battle. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He taught us to pray. When Jesus launched the aggressive invasion of earth by the kingdom of heaven, it was prayer that sustained him when he went apart from everyone else to talk to his father. It was prayer that he taught his disciples to do in Matthew 6 and prayer that he offered for his disciples in John the 17th chapter. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible, Jesus praying for us. Prayer is the aggressive action that brings victory in spiritual warfare. And so we need to be aggressive through prayer. The blood of Jesus as a weapon. We studied Sunday about that scarlet cord. That scarlet cord. Rahab put out her cord, but we see the scarlet cord of redemption throughout the Word of God. And it's through Christ's sacrifice for us. So without, without the blood of Jesus, we would all be fighting Satan in vain. We would be defeated. There could be no hope of victory over the devil and his devices. The blood of Jesus has been shed and the victory has been won. 
So there is power in the blood. And then it represents Christ's sacrifice for us. In Leviticus 17.11, long before there was a new covenant, God stated the condition for atonement by declaring, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So we can't take the blood out of the hymn book. Uh, because of the shed blood of the death of a spotless animal upon the altar, atonement or covering was provided for sin. In time, God provided for us his own sacrificial lamb, who was Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. A covenant was cut between humankind and God with the blood of Jesus. His blood is both the substance and representation of Christ's sacrifice for us. Ephesians 1 and 7 says we have redemption through his blood. There's power in the blood to save and release us from Satan's captivity. And so we know that in the uh, tabernacle worship, the Israelites, when they were worshiping, we know that they entered in through the gates of praise and they came to offer up the sacrifice. And then after the sacrifice, the atonement, then they went over to the laver to wash and get sanctified and cleansed. Uh, but when we look at their sacrifice, we look then and we rush forward through to the time that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. There were not enough animals animals created to, to meet what we needed to cause us to become sinless and meet for the master's use. And so it was through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and not only did he die but he rose again and he is ever interceding at the right hand of the Father for us. So we got, the, we got the power, we got the tools, we just need to understand that we've got to be bold enough to use them. And then the, the second part, it purifies us from sin. The blood does. Medical doctors know that when blood moves throughout the human body, it removes waste material from the body. It is the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus that purifies our spiritual hearts from the inside out. Just as blood carries away waste from the physical system, so the blood of Jesus is the only element in the universe that's able to take away the filth and the uncleanness of sin. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christians are thus made to be temples of the Holy Spirit because of the cleansing of His blood. When the Holy Spirit then has His abode in us, we have a ready power source that enables us to overcome and be victorious in warfare. So without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And then it gives us life. The life is in the blood. It is the blood of Jesus who has given us abundant life and that eternally. He didn't just give us life. He gave us abundant life. Amazing life. It is blood that is the life-giving substance that nourishes and provides the body with ongoing strength to keep on living. Jesus' shed blood has given believers a life that will continue on into eternity. John 6, 54, he promises, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The blood of Jesus defeats death. And then it controls our spiritual temperature. We're still talking about the blood of Jesus as a weapon. The human being is kept at a stable temperature by the warmth of the blood flowing through the body. Spiritual coldness in Matthew 24 and 12 speaks of love waxing cold. It is the condition of a soul when Satan or the flesh begins to dominate and enslave a believer. That was that part where we rub shoulders so often that we begin to take on the traits of the world rather than keeping uh, hot, uh, if you will, um, reflecting the characteristics of the Lord and Savior. And so uh, when it starts to dominate and enslave, enslave a believer, we talk about it being spiritual coldness. When sins accumulate, 
we don't ask forgiveness and we let them continue and we feel that prompting and we just let it continue when they accumulate spiritual coldness is sure to follow it is repentance and the application of the cleansing blood of Christ that restores spiritual warmth to our souls and it keeps us involved in our aggressive warfare against the enemy in order to fight the good fight, it gives us boldness. We fight as a tough, brave soldier. Each believer must possess the quality of boldness. This is a char an essential characteristic of a warrior whose courage and faith have come together in a powerful way. In the physical body, blood infuses energy and it allows muscles to expand and grow stronger. There is a spiritual boldness that allows a Christian to effectively wage spiritual warfare because of the sure knowledge that they have direct access to God through prayer. Jesus' blood gives us boldness to pray. Hebrews 10, 19 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Be bold. And so this is where we're talking about because we know that as they got on in to the Holy of Holies, that's where the priest only was allowed and that's where he had the bells around his, his um, covering his gown, his cape, and uh, there would be uh, bells around it and uh, they would tie a rope around him so that they could drag him out because if he had not, uh, if he went in unclean, he didn't come out. And so when we think about it and we think about running into Hebrew 10 19 he tells us to have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus you see because that's not because of our abilities or capabilities or anything that we ever did except that we latched onto him we reached out to him and we let him make that essential difference in our life we invited him in and we allow him to dominate us and to take us and use us for his glory. He helps us, the sixth point, he helps us to overcome the devil. Because the blood of, of Christ reconciles us to God and takes away the basis of Satan's condemnation, we're able to overcome the devil and give testimony to our victory. In Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So we'll overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of Christ, and by the word of our testimony. Have you got a testimony tonight? I believe each one of us have a story. God redeemed each one of us, and we each have a story to tell. Um, the name of Jesus as a weapon, his name makes demons tremble. There's no greater or more spiritually powerful name in the universe than the name of Jesus. Demons tremble and become fearful at the name of Jesus. Mark 1 and Luke 4 tell of an incident in which unclean spirits who were possessing a man knew the Lord and his name. Uh, Luke 4 and 34 tells us that these unclean spirits upon being confronted by the Lord cried out and said, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Thou Jesus of Nazareth, are thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And so clearly demonic spirits recognize supreme authority has the power to destroy them. And they were fearful of Jesus and his name. And it's evident and justified in this passage. And so there are many that we come in contact with that know of Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. And there's a lot that you'll come in contact with that will accept it if you testify that you love God. Oh yeah, they, they probably do too. They're God. But when you begin to be specific and you say the name of Jesus, that's where they're going to part company with you because so many don't believe in Jesus. They believe in God, but they don't believe in Jesus. And they don't believe in our God. They believe in a God. And so when we go out and we share our testimony, the thing that will win people is not your ability to be able to quote Scripture 90 miles an hour. Let me tell you what's going to impress people. You're living, obviously, but your word of your testimony that's going to impress people is when you give your testimony and you're on fire for God when you give it. When you act like it's just a story to tell, you know, 
just another day at, at the shop. It doesn't speak to them. But I promise that when you speak to somebody and you tell them what God has done for you and it is running up and down the avenues of your heart and soul, they will be able to feel it. They'll be able to tell it. And they will say, what in the world has that person got? I want some of it. Amen. I want some of it. The name of Jesus is our effective weapon in spiritual warfare because it's a name that has power to cast out demons. The Lord himself says that when we ask anything in his name, he will do it. When Jesus Christ, who is the king of the kingdom of God, invites his people to use his holy name, he's inviting Christians to share in his authority. We have privilege, delegated influence, and make kingdom use of his power or force for the glory of God. And so we have authority. We can use force all for the glory of God, not for self, but for the glory of God. In Mark 16, 17, Jesus said that believers would drive out demons and speak in new tongues in his name. Jesus' name given to him by the Father is the name at which every knee will bow in subjection. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father at the name of Jesus. To be used, Jesus' names to be used as an effective weapon, and it must be used properly, not profaned or taken in vain. It's not to be used by someone who is, uh, and it is to be used by someone who is not working iniquity. We must have the right motives when we are invoking the name of Jesus. You must truly have Jesus living on the inside to use the authority of his name. If you remember in Acts 19, the seven sons of Siva, attempting to cast out a demon in the name of Jesus, were beaten, stripped of their clothing, and chased away, all because they tried to use the power of Jesus' name without truly possessing the authority of his name. That reminds me of not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so if the church is to be genuine, a genuine army working together, serving together and making spiritual war upon the kingdom of hell, then it must be a unified force under the command of Jesus Christ. No place for division, strife, and rebellion. The enemy thrives on a carnal atmosphere such as this. In fact, the church was designed and empowered by the Lord to be a diverse, many gifts, many nationalities, many personalities, but unified body of believers under the headship of Christ. The world will not know we are a disciple unless we what? Love one another. He says, by your love, I'll know that you are disciples. And so by his love and live out one unified testimony of loving, compassion, and purity before a strife-ridden world. In Acts 2, the world did not comprehend what was going on in the upper room, but the writer of Acts understood full well that the Holy Spirit had come upon a group of believers who, had, who were in one accord. The prayers of agreement between Christians as well as church-wide corporate prayer have been hallmarks of the Pentecostal church throughout the years. There is power in prayer, but there is extra power in the prayer of agreement. And so we are unified. We we are one body in union with Christ. And when we come together, unified together as one with the same mission, the Great Commission, there is absolutely no reason why we can't be successful. And that's the Word of God. The Word of God tells us that if we are putting on our armor, if we have the fruit of the Spirit, if that love is emanating so that we, the church, are known to the world as being loving, then, you know, it, we're not always seeking self, but we're looking to serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're not selfish in motives or deeds. The Holy Spirit seems to be moved by such fervent, unified petition. 
The agreement and unity of believers is important. And if we look at 1 John 5 and 7, he prays that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. We're going to stop there uh, because it's 829. Um, and we'll pick up next week on um, talking about fasting under uh, being a combat-ready soldier. I want to thank you tonight. I want just to remind us out of what we've talked about is the characteristics. We've talked about how we need to be strong and bold and aggressive. Uh, all of these adjectives that we talked about tonight um, because we want to win. And what they are, every single one of them, are action things and that just reinforces back to us that we are not just to be hearers but we are to be doers and so we must be ready we must be willing to do willing to do the will of the Father and we must be ready to do the will of the Father and so if we're praying we're reading our Bibles we are equipping ourselves there's no reason why we can't be successful and look we don't have long we don't have long because the trumpet, I feel like, is just already being picked up and heading towards his lips. And he's going to blow that trumpet, Sister Bradshaw, and we're going to take off from this place. You know, we're going to be ready to be caught up in the air. And so we want to occupy by doing something for the Father, we want to occupy. And so we want to do more than just breathe and go through life and face these troubles and trials. We want to be victorious Christians, something that we, our children can be proud of, our church can be proud of, our families can be proud of, because we are going to stand before an almighty God and he's going to hold us accountable for those giftedness things that he placed in us. Each one of us are gifted. Each one of us have been called to a, for a purpose and a work and we must be ready to stand and put our hand in position and say yes father show me what to do and so many times when we see something not being done we're seeing it because God wants us to do it so we need to be in tune with the spirit of God and follow the leading of the Lord amen let's have our dismissal prayer I'm going to ask my brother Dermot. Father, we give you thanks and praise this evening for your divine goodness, your love, and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for that we can gather together tonight to listen to your word once more. Pray, oh Father, that our hearts will be open and receive all the things that have been said tonight, that after we leave here, they will rest on our hearts. That continually, Lord, we will remember them and live by your word and do your work in spirit and in truth. Bless and sanctify us tonight, Lord, and guide us and protect us throughout the rest of this week. Bless the teacher another time, Lord, I pray. We give you thanks in Jesus' name.